I'd now like to call on Professor Ronnie Weber Youngman to give a brief overview of current activities within the Department of Mining Engineering. Um, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, Professor Mirage. Thank you very much for joining us this afternoon. I didn't want to get rid of that thing. And uh, also uh, the members uh, from MASIP, um, Mr. Henry Lars, also welcome. It's always nice to see you. And uh, Prof. Kanya, uh, we've got a long uh, history together. Uh, he appointed me at H.J. Joel <laughs> as a project mining engineer, I think 1980-something, I can't even remember. And I was very afraid of you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, um, but it just comes from my Calvinistic background. You respect the senior and the bold. <laughs> so thank you for that. Uh, you've played a very significant role in my life. So also thank you for that. I really appreciate that. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, just from my side, um, I was asked to just give a quick overview. And normally with me, it's not quick. Because I've got so much to say that I always don't have enough time to say what I want to say. But I've decided to share with you, and I also see that time is in my favor, so I'm definitely not going to keep it till quarter past three. But I know uh, Danny Lawrence has always had a comment about me not getting finished, but that's also another story. Um, like I said uh, from my presentation, I'm just going to highlight a few issues pertaining to our student numbers, the staff, the research in the department, teaching and learning in terms of the undergraduate and postgraduate. Uh, specifically re research from an applied research perspective and then the changes that took place in the department as well as some concluding comments. Uh, and thank you for listening to me this afternoon. Um, I found this from a NetBank ad uh, many years ago and I thought it was quite um, relevant in the context of maybe a, a tablet or a tablet underground and it was showing uh, Africa and the technology drive within Africa. And I thought as from a department perspective that we are in Africa for Africa, and I thought that was quite uh, relevant in terms of where we're going with all of this. But in saying this, I have to say that uh, in the context of this department, 21 uh, is a very special year for us, and I like to quote it as um, the department having 60 years of excellence in existence. And I'm very proud to be an alumni of this department as well, because at the end of the day, it shaped my career in many ways. Also, hashtag UP Mining Matters is a serious drive that we started three years ago. And the University of Pretoria, I think people never knew how much mining research we actually do. And it was actually not in the mining department specifically. And um, we just did a quick run uh, at the beginning of the year. And we picked up more than 100 researchers at this university doing actual research in mining. And no, and no one actually knew of them. And when we started doing this hashtag UP Mining Drive, it really came out that mining is actually quite a strong force at this university in terms of not just employment, but research-related activities. We started with this annual review approach three years ago, and I think that was one thing that really put us on the map, because at the end of the day, um, we were really not visible internationally, and at the end of the day, we wanted to show that we are actually a force to be reckoned with and I must say, I think this annual review that went out electronically to the rest of the world mining schools and the fact that it was sent out to all our alumni uh, on, a, on a continuous basis, I think really enhanced our visibility quite significantly. And obviously, because it's electronic, it's, it's easier to distribute. And obviously, when we have meetings like this, we hand them out as hard copies because it really emphasized the fact that we wanted to push our, availability, our visibility to quite an extent. What I'm also proud to say in 2019, this whole turnaround of being recognized internationally started when we were, by the Web of Science data being used to actually show that for mining and mineral engineering, we were in the top 100 worldwide. And that already then indicated to me that was the first step towards being recognized internationally. And like you've heard earlier this afternoon, when Professor Maraj mentioned it, is that uh, we, for the first time in the history of this department, is internationally recognized being the, in the top 50 mining schools in the world, and something that I'm very, very proud of, and happy to be part of that and part of this relevation that took place in our department over the last few years. When we look at our vision statement as a department, we've always maintained, it's very similar to the, the, the vision statement of the University of Pretoria, 
And all I did, I just replaced it, the University of Pretoria, with the Mining Engineering Department. And obviously, it's all about quality, relevance, and the impact that we make. And also, then specifically in our department, the development of people and creating knowledge and definitely want to make, and actually already do, uh, make a difference locally and globally. In 2007, when I was appointed as the head of department, I did not even know of a society which was called the Society of Mining Professors. And uh, I just realized that at that point in time, because of the fact that we were not very well known from a visible perspective that we had to join. And I went to Germany in Aachen in 2008 because I was appointed in 2007 and 2008 was my first time that I actually got the opportunity to join this society. I was very fortunate to be appointed the president of this society and they came to South Africa and they visited Wits University and ourselves, um, me being the president for that society. And I think that, not, I think I know that was in 2014. And I really think that was the turnaround in terms of our visibility internationally. And I can proudly say that all my staff members in the department are now members of the Society of Mining Professors internationally, and it's opened many, many doors for us, not just from a visibility perspective, but in terms of our external examiners' profiles that we started picking up worldwide. Now, what I decided to show you there is that uh, the Society of Mining Professors started off as a German uh, initiative many, many years ago. As a matter of fact, more than 100 years ago. And then it died after the world wars, and it was actually reinstated later. And I think it was reinstated later, at almost 30 years ago. And if you can see there, that's already 280 members active at the society. And I think the one thing that I do think is quite uh, important to note is that there's 46 countries that form part of this society and that the total number of universities from a mining perspective is 118 universities. And we are being seen as one of the partners of this society in terms of our contributions. And uh, many of our members already have made contributions, specifically Dr. Mayer, uh, uh, Dr. Ace and myself as well, uh, uh, as part of our visibility drive in that, in that, envi in that environment. I want, I'm not going to talk about the five strategic goals, but it also aligns itself with the, the goals from the University of Pretoria specifically. And it's basically also to say that we want to be a leading research intensive department. And you'll see some of the slides I'm going to share with you that I really think that we've pursued it. And I think in many ways, we're already on the right track to get that going. Also pursue ourselves in, in terms of excellence in teaching and learning and also the new technology in terms of immersive technology for teaching and learning and bring on board immersive technology as part of our strategy. Then to be recognized continuously for the quality of our graduates, we're very proud of that. And at the end of the day, um, we also at graduation give them that pin that says that's our stamp of approval uh, as part of our department. And then I think one of the key things that we had as our strategic goal when I started this HOD in 2008 was really to strengthen the department's national and international profile. Um, and I think the fact that we have got now sustainable business and other relationships going, I think it's actually put us on the map in a big way. And then the last one, which I can really thank the uh, alumni from this department, all the chairs, all the research funding, everything that I've got from this, uh, uh, from, for my department was really all from alumni from this department. And I can only say that in many ways, if it wasn't for the contribution and the funding that I got from my alumni uh, colleagues in industry, and obviously it's almost impossible to mention all their names, but they really have enhanced the visibility and also make us a much more sustainable unit in terms of providing our own third stream funding. I think we're one of the only departments at this university and we followed suit with what's happening at the mining industry in terms of values. Um, we're dealing with the leadership drive at Harmony quite aggressively. Um, we've also got the leadership drive with uh, Marion Roberts. But um, I think we're one of the few departments that got five um, value systems or five values that we drive in the department, which is respect, caring, honesty, integrity and trust. 
and we drive those quite significantly in the department because we say to our students that all relates to industry and also relates to the academic environment that, they, that they're living in. And when you hear the word T's and C's apply, you always think terms and conditions, uh, which is prohibiting you from taking, uh, uh, getting involved with, with whatever products being advertised. And I've already started getting all of the Harmony guys not to think terms, terms and conditions, but maybe think trust and care, uh, which is literally the basis of heartfelt leadership. And I've always said to my students, they can never, we, uh, they can never trust, and you can never get someone to trust you unless they can see that you actually care. With regards to the mining engineering curriculum, at the advisory board meeting in 2019, we decided the mining advisory board, it was suggested by the board that we should not necessarily start with new modules or new subject matter, but we rather should look at our own curriculum and actually then enhance the specific content within the curriculum and actually make it fit, suit fit for the, for the activities within the department and for our students. And then also, uh, from uh, another perspective, we also said the, that the mining and department should realign itself in terms of industry challenges, in terms of social and economic challenges now and also for the future. So it's more of a socio-technical type of environment that we are in now, and rather than not just technical. And I'd like to share with you guys something that, uh, that's quite dear to my heart, is uh, the, the skills that we're going to have needed or that we will have to have for our students developed in many ways and also once they've left the university in terms of uh, uh, surviving or thriving in this fourth industrial revolution is that um, if you look at the World Economic Forum um, study that they did early in 2015, the top three um, uh, uh, skills that was highlighted was the complex problem solving, uh, coordinating with others, and uh, the third one was people management, and you could actually um, add um, uh, leadership and, uh, as a component of that. And, not, and within five years, it changed completely to still stay in complex problem solving, but look what happened. Suddenly, critical thinking jumped up onto spot number two, and creativity and right-brain thinking is becoming now more and more important. And I think the most important part, if you had to go look at all of those points, all 10 those skills, that there's not a lot of uh, real technical skills highlighted in that context, but it doesn't mean that it's not important. And in our department, we are driving this now that in the context of our delivery from the academic perspective, that we address those skills also accordingly. So let me share with you some uh, 60 years graduate numbers. Uh, I was actually smiling when Professor Fukonia was mentioning his first year date and everything. I actually, when I drew up this presentation, <laughs> I picked up all the statistics from 1965, the Mac from 61, and just to uh, enlighten your day, there was 25 other students in the first four years from other departments that all graduated. <laughs> so it was actually, I think it was quite well done uh, from that first years of existence, but you're quite right, 65 was the very first first year group of which you were part of, and Dirk as well but it's actually showed quite nicely in my statistics. And uh, I want to share with you this graph. Um, what is quite uh, uh, important if you look at it, this is the mining graduates from 1964 to 2000. Now the 64 was the first group, the, the one, two, three, fours, the guys from mining and uh, from civil and so forth. I must imagine also maybe mechanical. But this is the slide that's broken it up into decades from the first 10 years to the last, uh, in other words, the 60 years, the sixth decade, and you can see the significant growth in terms of our uh, undergraduate or the mining graduates uh, over that 60-year period and with the most significant jump uh, in the last 10 years um, of existence. We've had an industry, uh, uh, let's call it a, a drop-down in terms of, of, of commodity and everything, and that has really had uh, in terms of prices and so forth, it really had an influence on the number of students. And the one thing that we're really struggling at this point is to really implicate or make that mining is a much more sexier uh, environment than people most probably think. And uh, the, the idea of this whole immersive training and immersive technology, robotics, automation, I believe is the key to get more students involved with mining uh, as a career or mining engineering then specifically as a career. 
The next slide I want to show you, and I think Professor Fokonier, being the first honors degree student, 100% pass rate, was quite sharp. I really enjoyed that one. Um, the mining department, and I say this with all due respect, even in my time when I was here, was not really prominent involved in postgraduate numbers, postgraduate students, postgraduate research, and it was really something that I think only in the late 90s, uh, early 2000s, started becoming an important aspect of this department to drive. And when I drew up this, um, uh, this slide with regards to the uh, total number of undergraduate and postgraduate graduation numbers over the 60 years, you can see that it was really from a postgraduate perspective um, and that postgraduate means it's also masters, honors, and postgraduate students. Also in a tenure bracket space, but you can see there was a much more significant increase uh, in terms of undergraduate graduates, and also slowly but surely only from about the 30th year of existence that we started uh, prov providing industry with more, more people involved with postgraduate studies. And I must say that it's already being pushed quite hard in our department to increase our student numbers. And the way we played with this is that um, because our student numbers started reducing the uh, undergraduate numbers, we made a strategic decision to sustain the numbers that we currently have, around about 120 um, students in, in, in the four years of study, and that we would push the, um, the postgraduate numbers, that we want to push it to at least 80. So that would then give us almost a two-third third split where a third of the new knowledge development happens in the postgraduate space and the application of those new knowledge then happens in the undergraduate space. And I think that was quite an uh, important decision because at the end of the day, um, and I'll show you some other numbers just in, the, in the next few slides, it really enhanced our visibility in terms of capacity building and capability in terms of research in the industry. And I think that's something that, that I'm very proud of. We also um, started with this process of full-time postgraduate students. Um, it's also quite nice to know that this year, 2021, also is the highest number of full-time postgraduate students being sponsored through the research chairs that we have, as well as funding from uh, the, the likes of ASMANG, the arm leg, that's actually sponsoring four of our postgraduate students in a postgraduate environment. We have nine students full-time in terms of master's engineering two honors degrees and one PhD full-time. And um, why I'm so proud of that is that when we started with these high student numbers in the early, two th early 2010s, we had to have support from our assistant lecturer's perspective, and we actually got these guys going uh, in this process, being supportive of what, what we're doing. And I think the nice thing about what we've done is that um, those are the next generation of academics. Before, we never had that pipeline of potential academics in the past, and we were also running around uh, with people with no uh, higher qualifications, and that actually is now, in the university sense nowadays, you cannot be appointed as a senior lecturer unless you've got at least a PhD. And that also is, is a restriction uh, in terms of if we did not have a pipeline. So I'm very happy that we had that pipeline. So what is the, the actual successes that we've had? I've mentioned that this now, the, la the largest number of full-time postgraduate students, the largest number of postgraduate graduates ever. There were 13 of them in the April um, graduation ceremony, um, uh, which I'm very proud of because three of them were um, master's degree students and 20, 10 of them were the honors degrees. And incidentally, all 10 of those honors degree students are actually now registered for master's degrees full-time in the department. And, and, and I think at the end of the day, the fact that we've changed our emphasis to our postgraduate environment for our future careers or future careers, academic careers for our students was the right decision. And then also between 2020 and 21, we've always also had the highest, largest or the largest number of postgraduate students, namely an average of 56 over the two years, uh, which is almost the same number of the intake in the late 1960s for the, for the undergraduate program. So I'm very happy to see that we're actually pushing this postgraduate space the way we've been doing it. Then just with regards to staff related matters that we have, um, we've always been a very small department. We only have nine um, uh, people on staff, of which um, uh, seven as lecturers, one position is still vacant. 
And then at the end of the day, also, we've only had the two positions from an administrative perspective, uh, which is the secretary and then also our messenger uh, in the department. Uh, and this makes us quite vulnerable because at the end of the day, um, we have uh, some uh, people going on, on pension within the next two or three years, which means that the pipeline will definitely kick into play in terms of our new academic blood for the department. And then I'm glad to say that we've had our first NRF uh, researcher uh, rated by the NRF, Professor Malan. I know that Nilan van Amerwe also was an NRF rated uh, lecturer. I think he was an A rated if I'm, under, I'm talking under correction. But uh, getting Professor Malan on board as, as one of our very first in my time um, NRF rated research has actually enhanced our ability in terms of uh, rock engineering skills and, uh, and, and enhancing the whole rock engineering environment within the department. Then also we have the honorary and extraordinary professors. Um, I must say that in terms of the appointment, unless there was an appointment and was needed within a research chair environment, these people normally appointed at no numeration which means that they do it for free and that they actually help a lot within the actual academic research environment and also the postgraduate specifically. So they don't have actual lecturing functions, but they do research. And um, uh, Professor Napier is working in the Harmony Chair for Numerical Modeling. Professor Spateri is appointed in the AECI Chair with Innovative Rock Breaking and then um, at the end of the day, what we, if we did not have them on board, obviously the capacity in terms of research would not have been as much as we already have it. When I took over the department uh, in 2007, we were nine people in the department, and, uh, and it's still the nine people, which is the full-time university appointments um, that we actually get paid for by the university itself. And what then happened was, in terms of the growth of numbers, I then went out to see how can we actually enhance this whole learning experience for our students by appointing additional people in this context that I'm showing now. And what we have now is with the research chairs that we started appointed in the department, the very first chair was the Sassel Chair uh, in Safety, um, which concluded two terms of three years and has actually set the, re the road for us in terms of new uh, research chairs for the future. And uh, obviously I've mentioned the Harmony Chair uh, for, um, uh, in terms of uh, the Chair in Numerical Modeling and Rock Engineering, the AECI Chair, and then Dr. Johan Asa myself being part of the Murray and Roberts uh, Chair in Industry 4.0 Leadership. Um, we also make uh, use of extraordinary, if not extraordinary, just lecturers on a contract basis in the postgraduate environment. We don't use any uh, a, a contract lecturers in the post in the undergraduate environment um, in terms of uh, this uh, ruling that we have and we've got the contract in support staff um, that's also involved with the chair finances and so forth and this is I think one of the success stories of the department which I've highlighted before they all uh, registered for their masters in um, uh, the, the, the two gentlemen on the right hand side they, uh, they the two honors degree students and the other eight are all being registered for their master's degrees. And I think at least half of them already indicated that they would like to pursue a PhD in the actual field that they've selected. So what am I saying? We've got 31 staff members on the books, um, which could still have been nine if we didn't have this view that we need to expand and that we need to grow whatever we have. And this numbers that I'm showing there in the picture would not have been possible unless the alumni of this university, mining specifically, supported us with the chairs and also supported us with funding and donations to actually make these uh, positions available. And the, this, the, the good thing about what we did is, like I said all along, is the capacity building and also capability over the period. So why am I showing this, ladies? Um, we've actually had a, a very important decision made 10 years ago that the elephant in the room with regards not passing your degree was English. And uh, we actually then appointed um, uh, Isabella Swart first time, I think it was in 2012, and uh, we started with this English literacy program. It was also sponsored by the industry, and to a, in a later stage it was actually the METF that started giving us funding for this because they saw the light in the context of what we were doing. 
We now have an English literate person, an English, uh, I call them my school teachers. They're in the department, each of them has a year group, and they actually work with the lecturers in terms of English literacy uh, from a first to final year perspective. And in the final year, they're very much involved with Isabella dealing with the dissertation English literacy as well as the importance of, of having a good written up document. And I do believe that that will be a definite uh, uh, game changer for our graduates in the future. The reason why we did this is literally because uh, uh, Afrikaans uh, or English first language is now only about 7% of the student body, which means that 93% of the students are actually being taught in the second language. And one of the key issues that we picked up in this whole testing and everything that we did for the students, because we do a lot of uh, psychomet psychometric assessments, and we call it the ELSA test, which is the English literacy skills assessment, and we find out quickly where the problem is. And incidentally, it was proven that one of the key problems that our students sit with is comprehension. They don't always understand what they read. And if you don't understand what you read, then it's very difficult to actually then apply that knowledge. And I think that was a very important uh, part of an initiative that we really wanted to pursue uh, quite aggressively, and we've actually stuck with that uh, over the last 10 years almost. Then also, um, the non-technical skills drive within the department. Um, one of the key things that we very soon realized, and that was also about 10 years ago, that our students go out of varsity with a technical basis, but they don't have a real feel for the soft skills or the non-technical skills. And at first, it was the Sassol Engineering Academy, um, but it started off as a leadership academy for our final year students so that we could actually teach them all of these um, uh, initiatives such as emotional intelligence, conflict management, understanding their own personalities and things like that. And we were very fortunate last year when Marine Roberts uh, started the chair in Industry Leadership 4.0. We've actually branded the Mining Engineering Leadership Academy as the Marion Roberts Mining Engineering Leadership Academy. And Henry, I would like to thank you for, for that initiative to be part of our Leadership Academy in, in that sense. Much appreciated. Then the other thing that uh, I think the department, which relates very much to your career as a mining engineer and a manager one day, is the student well-being or your people well-being within your department or within your section. And um, I can say that uh, even this year we already start, we paid for a lady that had no accommodation. We paid for students that don't have food. Uh, we've actually given them the meal cards that they're not being embarrassed. So, um, and I think the nice thing about it, making available their support needs within the department, and it's very well done, very discreetly, and no one knows who the people are that gets the support. And we do get money from ASAP that has helped us with this. And every time a student approached us, I just always thought, yes, it must be quite an embarrassing thing to approach your lecturer and say, I can't perform because I don't have food. And uh, the department took that up on themselves, that to stop that need by actually making funding available for the students. And, and incidentally, when you speak to the students, uh, they'd never know who actually got the support, but they know that there's support being given. And I think that's the nice part about our job, is to uplift and help these students with, with needy cases. And uh, Mr. Da Costa, uh, Mike, yes, it's, I'm so happy that we got to know each other better. Last year, he came to our Marion Roberts Leadership Academy Day, um, you know, as a welcome note for the students. As in this, uh, this is the, before the, the mind design, we divide the students, and Dr. Ace is in charge of that, we divide them into different groups by taking into consideration their disc profiles, the, um, their curses, and all of those, and we put them in groups that they are evenly balanced in terms of their capabilities within that group. And since we started doing that, we, started we did start uh, finding out that the, the, the work that's been done in groups are less um, argumentative, if you can put it that way, but I always say to the students when they start fighting, I get very excited because I like it, because then I know they, they, they start getting into the mining environment. And um, we actually had them yesterday, we spoke yesterday about their profiles, and uh, we will now set them up in groups, and when they go to this team building, uh, before COVID, we took them away for a weekend, and we actually then helped them to understand uh, the, the value of good teamwork as part of the whole mine design. 
Research initiatives, you saw on the board here, the Mining Resilience Research Center has been established as a multidisciplinary interfaculty interdepartmental research unit where you see the access is the MRRC. All the faculties are involved with that. And what we do with that now is to enhance our availability as a, uh, uh, an important factor in the rest of the university as well. I'm not going to talk about the actual, um, let's say, the vision of the Mining Resilience Research Center, but you can see in red, it's all about getting the mining industry from being reactive to be resilient in issues of safety, health, environment, and also then in terms of social responsibility and community management. The projects in the MRRC, that's all with the Mine Health and Safety Council. I'm not going to talk about those. It's just an indication to you that already the rock engineering is playing a very significant role in the Mine Health and Safety Council as well as Samardi, uh, which is on the Mandela Mining Precinct. If I look at the industry-related chairs, we in negotiations with the AECI with regards to the uh, continuation of the chair. We actually got to a bit of a stumble block with regards contracting, but they've confirmed with us that once the contractual issues have been sorted, that we will reinstate that chair that has been running for the last three years. The Harmony chair is now actually being involved. Peter Steenkamp is the uh, CEO. Um, it's in its third term of three years, so it's basically in the end of next year they would have been with us for nine years, and it's been really supportive in terms of our work that we do. Then Marion Roberts' chair, it's in the second year, and um, obviously we've highlighted a lot of good things, and we've already did a, a two research projects that we actually used from a Marion Roberts perspective, and we've actually, I spoke to Mike this morning, we're going to have a session with the senior managers at Murray and Roberts about the risk profiling that we did and how we can actually enhance the whole ad adoption to technology as well as improving of safety, uh, specifically for Murray and Roberts then, but also use that as a sort of base case going into other industries as well. And then also the Exaro chair has been established as from the first of this year. The main driver of this chair is the uh, Department of Information Science. We are the co-partners with this chair. Like we were the co part we were the main driver for the AECI chair in, 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 in collaboration with the Electric and Electronic Computer Engineering at this university. And I think the, the collaboration efforts between two departments and even sometimes three is going to become more and more important uh, in terms of our um, interdisciplinary research drive within the department. Then um, another important point uh, that I wanted to highlight is that um, we were very fortunate. We proposed to the South African Mining Extraction Research Development and Innovation, Samardi, which is at the Mandela Precinct, uh, the MMP, we call it. Um, they've actually opened um, the proposals for us that we could propose for a research center at our university. The three mining departments, UJ, Vits, and Tuckies, uh, uh, they put in uh, proposals uh, for these various focus areas, and we were then awarded the Mechanized Mining Systems Research Center, and it will be called the Samardi Mechanized Mining System, or the Samardi Research Center for Mechanized Mining Systems. And on that list, you can see the successful application of technology was um, proposed by WITS, they got that one. Longevity of the current mines is then, uh, was also uh, proposed by UJ, and obviously they will get that. And then uh, UJ and UP, because of our virtual reality, our augmented reality, and our capability in terms of visualization uh, with us and UJ, that will now be formalized in future as well. But UJ, I know, is very, very keen to collaborate with us in terms of drones and, and everything that's related to visualization from a 3D perspective. And then obviously WITS also um, uh, got the project or the research center pertaining to uh, real-time information systems. I'm not going to read through the publications. That was 2019. We had a bit of a hiccup in 2020 because of the no conferences possible, so that had a, a big influence on our publications. We've actually got a very, very strong pipeline for this year, and I, I, I can actually say to the dean that I think by end of this year we'll have the highest number we've ever had because of the pipeline already being filled. And that's all the conferences from 2019, but like I said last year, was quite sad because we could not present anything. I'm almost done. I'm not going to talk about this, but um, uh, Professor Fokonier alluded to this two years ago, the mine closure and rehabilitation. In future, we're going to close more mines than we're going to open them. And if we don't have the skills 
uh, and the knowledge base um, from a, a, a mind closure rehabilitation perspective, we're going to have problems. And all of those are relating to um, the, the lecturers within the department in terms of their research drives. Um, I, it's also quite nice to know that the blasting engineering and the surface mining excellence are being run by staff members, but the surface mining excellence one is being run by two um, alumni from Mexaro uh, and also Anglo-American, Henk Furi and Johanna Acher, and it's a very popular course. It's, it's running at about 58 members already per year doing that course, especially for people that never had surface mining exposure. And then when I say to the students, we're going to talk about marine mining and asteroid mining within the future, they think I'm smoking something, but um, Elon Musk is already showing that he wants to go for the biggest um, asteroid. And, 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 and because in, 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 in the sky, everything is everybody's. I'm going to show you just three small videos. I'm not going to show them full out. Um, the department made a very uh, important strategic decision that interactive immersive technology would be the, the key of future training. And um, when I first heard that you need to use gamification technology to, uh, in a non-gamification non environment, I thought, near well, this is not possible. You know? And now we've actually proven that with Xboxes and headsets and things like that, 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 that immersive technology use could enhance the learning experience in, in, in asymptotically uh, in terms of where we want to get guys in a short period of time. And we've already started um, uh, developing some of these interactions. In my department, Yanni Maritz is quite involved with this. And um, Yanni, may I say this? Four years ago, Yanni said to me, he doesn't want to have anything to do with VR. <laughs> and now and I can say, Yanni, thank you for that thinking change, because Yanni, in a big way, and I'm not trying to embarrass you, Yanni, um, I, I think sometimes you, when you're at that point, you know, nah, it's not going to work. And, and I'm so proud to say that when I, I listened to him the other day in terms of his PhD, that the interactive immersive technology is going to be formed part of that PhD of how you educate in a, in, in a rock engineering environment. So I really want to show you just some of the products that we already developed. And uh, like I said, it's, it's, it's 20 seconds I'm going to show each. The first one is about hazard identification in a surface mine, and you'll see the hands or the, the, the clickers. Uh, what do you call these things, Jan? Controllers. The controllers. You see my son is my, he's better than, on me than, than I myself. Now, if you look at this video, um, there's the controllers. Um, you see it's a, it's a site visit. The guy's got the headset on, and it can actually then swing around uh, while there's people there, and you'll see at some point there's a transponder, it transponds to a highway or a high wall, and you will see, and I'm just going to show it when they do that, that they will highlight it, and then you will be able to calculate volumes and so forth based on that visual that they show there. And like I said, that, that could become something quite worthwhile in the future uh, in terms of, of using it as an augmented reality virtual space. The next video is um, a MMU truck from an explosive perspective. You'll see there's a tablet, and the tablet uh, that the people have is a virtual tablet, and that you can punch in your student number, you can do the actual visualize or the actual investigation around the truck. Like I said, this is a training environment. We're actually looking at, uh, I think there's two companies at this stage that approached us that said we must help them in their training centers because I've always maintained a university is for education, not necessarily training, but the fact that we're already developing this from a training perspective for the industry, it's quite, it's quite handy to know. And like I said, you can, you can see there's a transponder and you can move around the truck, you can identify mistakes, and at the end, you get a mark out of whatever, and it, it can deem you be competent or not because you've missed out on some of the aspects pertaining to that. And then the last one is also, um, I'm not going to show the whole one, it's a rock engineering one where um, you actually, you can see the hand that's waving. It's doing exactly what the robot is doing. And at the end of the day, um, it's, it's also in a small space that you do all the activities so that you could see um, you know, the various hazards from a rock engineering perspective and also being assessed continuously and automatically while you're doing that. And if you look at this, this is really gamification at play and you just actually have to do that uh, and to take part of that. The METF has made available a lot of capital specifically for the ventilation enhancement. Um, you can see the, all of the equipment that is actually now in our arm room. 
And, and um, the sad thing about it is that only the postgraduates had the privilege to work on it because the students have never been on campus the whole of last year. And all of these equipment is, is aimed at the third and fourth year ventilation course. So in conclusion, UP mining matters, definitely. I have no doubt that it will grow even further at this university. Our ranking drive and the increase in our research publications is obviously a key objective for the next five years. And next year is our X accreditation, which obviously we will um, also uh, do well. Then obviously very proud of our, our world rankings. Um, uh, I think with everything that we do, we want to push it even further and get to the top 20 in the world. And I don't think that's impossible. Then also the academic ranking that we got credit for in 2019, very dear to our hearts. And then the department is obviously now boasting with world-class facilities. Um, I mean, even the VR center with the cylinder and also the theater has been very well uh, exposed in industry and a lot of people make use of that, uh, of that facility to uh, come and do some of the work that they, that they want to do. Then also the industry support, alumni specifically, very well supported and I expect that to be continued. The non-technical skills um, my, with, the, with the management and leadership, which is now part of the mind design also, um, we say that it'll further enhance uh, our students' capability. The English competency definitely, I think, will not stop. Um, well, at least not while I'm still there. And then also the MRRC, which I think from a third stream potential income is quite important for us. Then bursaries and white student numbers, uh, quite a concern. Uh, only about 30% of our students have bursaries. Um, and I think in the old days, uh, students came to varsity, all of them had, had bursaries. And also from a white student numbers perspective, I think we only have 10 students of 123 that are white students at this stage. And it's quite incidentally that when I took over as HOD, it was all white students. Then I went into 50-50, and I think now we, and that time we said we must increase our black students, our HTSA students, and now I'm saying let's increase the white student population as well. To have that demographic mix, we've always been very proud of, and I think we need to work on that from a marketing perspective. The Mining Engineering South Africa Initiative, that's the four mining universities. I'm the current chairperson. And I think all the initiatives that has happened at Samardi and the Mandela Mining Precincts is because we worked as a group and we were not opposing each other's uh, work of doing and we looked at where the skills were actually lying from a university to university perspective. And then the low student numbers in the first year, obviously a concern, but um, this year, uh, I've checked the last numbers, Prof, it's now 31 first years, and the year before it was only 20. So I think our marketing drive has actually did pay dividends, and I, I, I would imagine we would just keep going and it'll be as good as I think we can have it. And then this um, slogan of ours, educating and leading our mining students to become imagineers, remains a focus area and a, a, a real drive towards our, an area of our drive towards our students. And then obviously I can't say enough about virtual reality and the mining educational strategies, <coughs> uh, resulting obviously to the better understanding of complexities in the mining education um, applications. And then the interactive immersive technology, I believe in future, is going to play a significant role because we have a visual nation. The students don't want to read books anymore. You've got to involve them visually um, in terms of what they're doing. And then obviously industry chairs and support will always remain very important in this department. Lastly, I want to acknowledge the support that I get from the dean and the faculty, Professor Maraj, uh, Masip, uh, the industry um, through donations and chair funding support, the METF for capital funding for equipment, and then my staff and students, and then obviously my family at home as well, because many hours, many weekends, I, I just work and work, and then they don't even get half upset with me. So. Uh, for my family at home, I'd like to thank them as well. And um, in conclusion, thank you for being here today. It's really been nice having this. This was an experiment for us. It worked very, very well. And Berti, congratulations. I think it came out all well done. And um, I'm very proud to be associated. Thank you very much. You've been such a driving force, Ronnie, ever since you got here. And 
the excellence in training, which is the fundamental drive right through everything you do. Um, the main thing is to be relevant in the industry. Whatever you do, be relevant. And as Mike had said, we have to be both enablers and catalysts for change, for, to mechanize mining, to become competitive worldwide. And everything you said here and done is geared towards that, geared towards success, and enabling your, the students to be successful. And I congratulate you really on, on, on what you guys are doing here and Professor Maharaj on, at, at the university.